we're going to talk about why racism persists. <clears throat> and as someone said to me, there's a lot of racism on the agenda for this conference, isn't there? And I said, that's because racism is on the agenda. And it hasn't gone away. And there is so much more to interrogate still. And today's panel, well, there's no exception to, to really challenging this topic and unpacking it fearlessly. So I'd like to call up in no particular order um, our panelists for the day on the issue of systemic racism, why racism persists in society. The first being Ruby Hamad. Is Ruby there? Yes. So <laughs> Ruby, is, Ruby is an author, journalist and emerging academic, currently completing a PhD in the media. Her best-selling debut book, White Tears, Brown Scars, traces the role that white womanhood and feminism have played in the development of Western power structures. She spent five years as a columnist for Fairfax, um, talking to feminist portrayal in daily life, and talking to feminist portrayal in, the, in daily life. Her columns, analysis, literary reviews, and essays have also featured in Australian publications, the Saturday paper, Mianjin, Crikey, and Eureka Street, to name but a few. Our next guest is Dr. Virginia Mapidzahama. She's <clears throat> Virginia is a member, is the education member and director of Diversity Council Australia. Many of you might be familiar with that entity. She's a first-generation black African migrant woman and a critical race black feminist scholar in the broader field of sociology of difference. Her research interest is in, understanding, is in understanding the social construction of all categories of difference. She's published extensively and as well in, in broader fields on cross-cultural identities, African feminism, post-colonial feminism, new African diaspora in Australia, and African women diaspora specifically. Our third panelist is Teela Reed. Teela. I love, I love that her bio actually says she's a rebellious lawyer, full stop. A storyteller, an essayist, and a proud Wurundjeri and Wallawan woman. Um, and and co-founder of Blackfella Book Club, which is an Instagram platform honoring First Nations ancestors as original storytellers. She's currently a Sydney-based senior solicitor in Aboriginal land rights litigation, and 2022 this year was appointed the inaugural First Nations lawyer in residence at Sydney University Law School. She's also a key advocate for the Uluru Statement from the Heart and recently has been appointed to the federal government's referendum engagement group, providing strategic input for a referendum on a First Nations voice to parliament. She was awarded the Australian Law Awards Indigenous Leader of the Year this year as well. And our final panelist, probably needs no introduction, but I shall, is Irfan Deliri. He's an author, educator, <clears throat> It says here that he's a highly sought after social change consultant and Jedi specialist, but he's also a troublemaker and an upstart and I think critical to being here to further this conversation with 20 years of professional experience in social change initiatives, including participatory community development, First Nations advocacy, cross-cultural communication, migration and settlement services, anti-racism training, and consulting systems so on social change. I kind of feel like we're done for the day now, which is with that introduction, but I am going to join the panellists and start the conversation. So am I on? Yes. yes, I am on here. Okay, terrific. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and getting this conversation kick-started. Just for a bit of context, in the last... Two weeks, we've seen a top Queensland police officer um, charged with some horrific acts of racism and commentary. We've also seen the Media Diversity Australia's report just launched today that outlined in their report 2.0 of who gets to tell Australian stories reveal that on Indigenous and cultural diversity um, on, on, me on metrics of Indigenous and cultural diverse representation in television news, we are still woefully underrepresented and still significantly lacking presence. We've also seen an escalation in, or rather a de-escalation in the representation of diverse leadership across the country in various tiers of government, business and education. 
So it, we have a problem. We have a problem here in terms of representation, in the way we respect, the way we treat and include. Um, Virginia, can I start with you? How do we begin to remedy, remedy a disease of racism which is spread through all aspects of our lives? Do we start with us or do we start with the system? Uh, just in terms of racism? Yeah, where do we start? Is it internal, is it I external? I think it's just one, Australians have to accept that we live in a racist culture, a racist society. Can you all hear at the back? No, and, speak up a bit. Just and racist systems. Um, I think one of the probably things that Australians generally haven't confronted yet is that the status quo is inherently racist, which makes it, I think, um, you know, people who have benefited and privileged off these particular systems, unless you've borne the brunt of racism in this colony or been able to be an ally and observe it, then you kind of can't see it. So, um, you know, many, ex the, the example of what's happened in Queensland recently around the QPS um, finding of systemic racism, no one losing their jobs. The issue is I think we don't know that racism doesn't exist. It's the fact that there's no accountability in the colony when, you know, these acts of racism are perpetrated. So I think we're pretty smart people if you've kind of experienced the brunt end of racism. I don't think it's one or the other. Is it systems or is it us? I think we can deal with both at the one time. Um, so yeah, I think we're still, like one thing as a lawyer, especially traveling the country, um, doing the advocacy that I've done around, for example, the Uluru Statement, or even, you know, things like the Wallama Court in New South Wales. Um, in terms of doing this advocacy, it really is about trying to um, allow Australians to understand the way in which racism functions. So, you know, if I look at something like the process that underpinned um, the Uluru Statement and the dialogues, I was a working group leader on Section 5126, which is the race power of the Australian Constitution. And, um, you know, this isn't my system. Um, I, I've, I've basically become a lawyer out of an obligation, really, to try and better understand and dismantle this, not because of things like reconciliation, but in spite of it. So going out and doing the work um, and trying to, I guess, allow Australians to understand that it is their responsibility to dismantle this um, racism, it, it's shocking that so many don't see it themselves and we have to do the heavy lifting. Yeah. I mean, they don't all see it. Some do. Some, I, mean, I would think it's safe to say majority don't. Virginia, how do we bring those who don't see it, who should be at this table, how do we bring them here? So I think, for me, one of the th things that's really problematic in Australia is that um, we are a country that's basically founded on racism. The whole idea, idea behind colonisation is racism, like colonization is a process that's built on and thrives and is sustained by racism because it's about um, inferiorizing one group of people and depriving them of all um, access to everything and um, you know, uh, while privileging another group. So we're founded on that in Australia. And what boggles me as a migrant coming into Australia was, or what really like shocked me was the silence around that and the mm -hmm. denial and the unwillingness to talk about, we are a country that's basically built on racism, right? So it's like, there's this, all this stuff, the white Australia policy, everything happened. And then we all of a sudden literally turned the page in a book and then we forgot about everything else. We're like, oh, look at us, we're multicultural now, so we don't have to worry <laughs> about racism anymore because we're, you know, we're inclusive, we're everything. Which is fine, look, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying all of that stuff is, is wrong at all. Um, I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be here if something had happened, right? Um, but our unwillingness to talk about the consequences of what we did in the past is um, what's problematic. Thank you. Um, so I think it's the denial that's, that, that to me that's um, the problem and the silence around our past, mm. our unwillingness to acknowledge our past and the silence around our past. And so we don't talk about it. So when I talk about anti-racism, my starting point is always, always, let's talk about it. 
You know, we love to talk about, cultural, uh, about culture and multiculturalism and everything, and that's really good. But cu culture isn't race. And so to bring people along, we need to use race talk. We need to start talking about racism. All the conversations that I've been having for the last couple of days at this conference, we don't have them out there because people, and that's why people don't know about racism because we're just not talking about it. So for me to bring people along, race needs to be in Australian lexicon. Like it needs to be there and we need to be, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't and be. I guess, no, I, I, no, sorry to cut you off. I'm just trying to, I'm going to be a bit provocative here and Ruby, I'll shoot to you. Do we, do we just talk about racism or do we take the gloves off and do we get, I mean, your book, White Scars, Brown Tears? Are you White Tears, Brown Tears, sorry. White That's okay. White Tears. <laughs> Is, is talking about it enough? Do we start from there? No, it's the starting point. The starting yeah. point. Talking, talking is the starting point. Because you can't do anything unless you've yeah. talked about it. You can't yeah. fix what you don't know and you can't fix what you don't talk about. Yeah. That's why we're not fixing racism because we're not, it's not even, you know when you started, you said it's on the agenda and you're like, yeah, because it's on the agenda. It's never on the agenda because we're not talking about it. So for me, talking about it is only the starting point. Because if we keep talking about culture, we're going to fix culture. We're not going to fix race. You know what I mean? Mm. So talking is, it's not the end at all. The end is action. Like we need to do something about it. So talking is really just the beginning. And I think as long as we continue, um, someone said to me, as long as we continue to find these nice little words to talk around racism, we're never going to get to it. We're never going to fix it. So mm -hmm. I think for me, we need to start, we need to put it on the agenda and talk about it first. It is. So Ruby, throwing yeah. to you on white tears, brown scars. Sorry for the mix up there. I mean, are we talking about it? Is, is, is starting to talk about it in your experience? Has it has it you know have you seen traction in the in the consequence of that? that? Well, that's the key word: consequence. There has to we talk about it, and I sorry we talk about it, and I wrote that book, and other people are writing books like that so that we can create a, a climate of consequences for mm. the behaviour and the actions and the attitudes that are described within the text. So I think, you know, in particular with why racism persists in progressive spaces mm -hmm. is that it's an insidious form of racism. It's insidious and it has plausible deniability. They can deny it and turn the tables back. and that is harder to call out than that explicit overt form. And, you know, the problem with, with progressives, often with white progressives and white liberals, is that they love to point the finger at conservatives. And yes, conservatives are better at the, better at the overt, explicit, I hate you, go back home, and mm -hmm. you, you know, Aboriginal people should be grateful, blah, 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 that, that sort of racism. And, what progressive racism does is, you know, I mean, Irfan last night said the perfect word, it's extractive. It takes from us. And you know the film Get Out? When that happens to you, when you see your work taken by white writers and rewritten as if they came up with it, it feels like they're taking it out of you and they've put you in that sunken place. Mm -hmm. And it just happened to me on the weekend. Believe it or not, like, it happened on the weekend a white woman, liberal writer, white liberal, small L liberal in the US took a term out of my book, White Tears, Brown Scars, a term that I termed the Lovejoy Trap. And the what trap? The Lovejoy Trap. So it's named after Helen Lovejoy and I used it to describe, I actually brought my book, I was going to read it out because I describe it much better in the book than I would now. But I initially came up with that after a few years ago, um, just before writing, the, well, while writing the book really. And it was on Invasion Day and I had just shared on my Facebook page I just shared a picture of a large, um, like a photo taken from the top of a really large Aboriginal flag at one of the protests. I, I didn't say anything, no words, no emojis. I, I wanted it to speak for itself, but no, no words from me. And some, you know, anonymous troll came on and just said, you know, he called me a, you know, a vile bitch um, for using Aboriginal people to, you know, just for my own agenda and then said that I need to calm my Arab ass down. I didn't say anything, mind you. All I did was share a flag. And then he said, what are you doing really to help Aboriginal people? Do you care about their suffering? You should be out in the outback helping them, you know? And I didn't respond to this person at all. 
Mm. And then three days later, that incident happened on TV with Kerry Ann Kennelly and Yumi Steins. Mm. Remember that? And Kerry Ann Kennelly said the exact same thing to Yumi Steins. When, so when Yumi Steins said, you're sounding a bit racist, you know, talking about, you know, Australia Day and, and Invasion Day. And Kerry Ann Kennelly said, well, do you care about the women and the children who are, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't want to use the words that she used. And I just thought, that's the exact same thing. So I called it, you know, the Lovejoy trap, Helen Lovejoy, you know, won't someone think of the children? So I used that term just to sort of draw people in. But what I'm really talking about is that it's an ethical bait and switch. It baits you into trying to bait you into responding to them to then change the subject entirely. So all of a sudden, they weren't, you know, with, with Kerry Ann Kennelly and Yumi Steins, they weren't talking about Australia Day anymore. Suddenly, Yumi Steins had to defend herself for not being in a remote community. That is a lovejoy trap, right? Yeah, yeah. It's that trap of, of using your own ethics and morals and polit social politics against you so that the, the actual, what is actually should be on the agenda is no longer on the agenda. And there, there's something about that, Dr. Ivan, there's something about that power dynamic, isn't there, of those in the progressive space who do, who do hold some sort of dominance in the narrative, whether it's, you know, well-meaning editors, well-meaning, you know, NGO leaders, for example, um, who presumably <coughs> are doing the work for improving race relations and community harmony and social cohesion, et cetera. But when we call them up on interrogating intention and accountability and consequence, there's often some crickets, right? Mm -hmm. What's been your experience in tackling that and some of the outcomes? I wish it was crickets. It's <laughs> an actual violent reaction when you question sometimes even just their presence in a particular position. Can you all hear him? It's not even just violence or crickets when we want to question some of the dynamics of how this country works. It's, there's a violent response to it, just like Ruby putting up an Aboriginal flag, there's a violent response mm. to that. So it's like, and then hand in hand with the violent response that we get from those overt ones is the silent violence that we get from our allies who aren't as vocal in those particular situations. I recently had a piece of feedback come back to me from a friend of mine who had heard in an organization that was considering doing some work with me, that oh, some of his anti-racism stuff is a bit too confronting for our staff. This is the same week that the lynching of Cassius Turvey had been spread across the planet, and we were grieving about the child of 15 being killed and the one on his way home, like, like we're back in the 1500s or something. And a well-meaning white woman earning taxpayer money says in the workplace that this is too confronting, the racism training is too confronting for them. So that's the part of the violence, but then also the silence that allows that, because that woman doesn't lose their job for that statement, everyone and that enables that sort of sentiment, it's completely normal, so there's a whole room full of people who don't say, actually, by you saying that anti-racism training is really confronting for you, you're actually helping to perpetuate racism further into the future, because no one's got the courage to say that. Why is that? Because we are at the bottom end of a power dynamic and they keep us there and our jobs and livelihoods are on the line. So anyone like myself or anyone else on this panel who speaks up, we are putting our livelihoods on the line every time we do that. Mm. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's not accidental, it's a systemic response. If you wanna see how, what a systemic response looks like, look at the response to Bill Leake's cartoons from the media, from SBS and ABC right through to Courier Mail and The Australian, and then look at the same news outlet's response to uh, Yasmin Abdul-Majid. It's a systemic response. It's across the board. Well, just, I mean, that's, and this is to both you and Teela here then. Does that mean that in, in the Australian context, in your experience, that, that we need a more culturally unique and tailored strategy to addressing systemic and micro experiences of racism that are going to be more palatable to those that flex at the R word? You want to start? I don't think it's, I, I'll be quick and I'll hand it. I don't think it's about being palatable. I think Virginia was talking about it right at the beginning. We just need to be allowed to talk about it to begin with, because that's not allowed yet. But how do we talk about it with impact beyond? So we've, we've got to talk beyond, to our, with our sense. allies, with our allies sense. who are here, and everyone else is going to watch this video later on, and everyone else is going to share this. It is our non colorized, non racialized allies out there, white Australians, who don't consider yourselves to be racist is to keep this story in mind. There was a panel of four white Australians <coughs> talking about the regionalization of, of migration and settlement services just a couple of weeks ago. Two white men, two white women, all being employed in the settlement services sector. And I made a comment on this post, a photograph on LinkedIn, and I said, does it occur to anybody on this panel that perhaps 
or the organizers or the audience that perhaps there should be at least one person with lived experience of migration and, and systemic racism on this panel to talk about it with the other four white people? Just a question. <laughs> but because I've got a relative who works at the organization that one of those panelists is on, I checked in with my relative and I said, hey, this is the comment that I just put up. And I just questioned, is, it, like, is that okay with you? And they said, listen, if it was any other organization, I'd, I'd be commenting on a post with you, but I don't want to lose my job over this. So just the fact that I'm related to that person and I've called out the overwhelming whiteness of a panel on systemic racism and, and settlement services, that person's job, my relative's job is now at risk. In, a, in an organization that works in the settlement services sector, that's how deeply ingrained and right to the bone racism is in our culture and our society. That even just talking about it in those progressive spaces is a threat to our relative's jobs. Well, I think yeah, yeah, Taylor. Danelle Wallam, Wallum, really, you know, the netballer, the Noongar netballer. I think she um, really spoke truth to power in relation to the way in which she chose to call out racism in her workforce, and that was a threat to her livelihood. Um, and Can you give us some context about that particular scenario? So, you know, the Aboriginal netballer who... Um, basically refused to wear the logo of uh, Gina Reinhardt's company and encouraged Netball Australia to not take the $15 million donation. And I think it's amazing how, you know, almost just a week later, she basically won the game for um, Australia and really changed the trajectory of, I think, Netball Australia. Mm -hmm. um, at least within that week. Um, and it really speaks to, I think, the volume of the way in which First Nations women carry such a load in this colony. Um, you know, we are consistently on the front line, whether that's our personal lives or our professional lives. And we may not achieve the systemic changes when it comes to racism ultimately in our lifetime, but it's important, I think, to take the steps along the way to leave, leave a legacy where we hand the baton over to the next generation of First Nations um, to be in a better position uh, when it comes to this underlying issue of racism in this colony, which is it really is about a power relationship. I think that's really what it is at the heart of it. Um, who has won the power to control, make decisions, um, to create narratives um, of particular people, uh, especially First Nations people. Uh, the silencing of our voices, for example, is literally the way power operates. And this is happening at all different levels in Australia, locally, state, territory, and federal levels. And I think what, the issue we have with grappling with these questions in this moment in time is that we are now 250 plus years into invasion. And so we're really talking about conversations that we're trying to retrofit a power balance that should have been done at first contact in Australia when you talk about, I guess, the rightful place of First Nations in this democracy. Um, who has the power to tell First Nations stories uh, and control that narrative. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other end of that is these notions around free speech. And, you know, on the one hand, you've got the far right thinking that they've got a free-for-all on us in relation to mm. um, these negative stereotypes, yet when we call that out, mm there's rarely any accountability. Um, so, you know, that's one, bringing it back to what we can do now. Yes, we can talk about it, you know, forever. But I do think that there is something significant in the moment in time we're at where um, there is a roadmap before our nation now in terms of um, carving out a new power relationship um, and that's written within the Uluru Statement, a roadmap for thinking at this is the federal level, okay? Australia is such an interesting colony as well um, that the way in which power operates is very different at the state and territory level as the, in comparison to the feds. And so keep that in mind when I'm talking about, you know, this notion of voice treaty truth um, at the federal level um, is really about 
calling upon Australians to dismantle their own system, to rewrite this place of First Nations voice in this national narrative that should have been done at Federation. I will be the first person to say this will not be the ultimate mm -hmm. fix, but it will be a stepping stone to building and reimagining a better future for our country when we start to put in place accountability mechanisms such as a voice where First Nations peoples can speak to their issues. And I just want to say one more thing about that um, because I know it has been mentioned perhaps a couple of times at this conference. It's this notion of First Nations sovereignty and what does this mean? And I think when you look at this concept from a First Nations point of view, it can mean different things to First Nations peoples to what it means to white Australia. For example, um, sovereignty, mm -hmm. in my view, um, firstly, as a Wiradjuri Wawan woman, um, can never be ceded by white laws. That is something that I own, my community own, and I practice that within my community. Um, but I think we should not look, allow debates and conversations around what is sovereignty block us from moving forward in serious systemic changes um, that reset the power relationship okay. in this country. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, taking taking from that that power analogy, Virginia, can I ask you, why? What do you think is the relationship between capitalism as an oppressive and exploitative system and systemic racism? How does one further the other? And how do you begin to maybe then address it? Uh, interesting question. Um, I think, I mean, capitalism is about, the, at the core of capitalism is whiteness, right? Capitalism is a, white, is a, is a system that's, um, sustained and upheld by whiteness, and that's how it sustains um, racism. So um, I think, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know what the, what the um, solution would be uh, in, in terms of um, capitalism, but I'll go to, um, to whiteness, really. What we need to be talking about in Australia is how whiteness is at the center of our entire, like all this, like it, it is very systemic. At the core of our systems in Australia, the core of capitalism is whiteness and a white racial frame. And how does and that said, manifest? Sorry? How do we see that manifesting in a way that is confronting and blocking and perpetrating discrimination? It means that the world that we see is white. It's seen through a white lens. It's seen through, a, it's seen through white eyes. Like um, she was just talking about, um, you know, I guess the voice that's, that's the power that's, um, or the people that are controlling or the power that's wielded in every aspect of Australian society is really kind of white power at the, at the core of it. And I think what, what we really should be talking about is really representation and diversity of voice at, those, at all of those levels. Because um, and, and recognizing that our systems are actually through that white racial frame and through that white lens. Well, given, I mean, Going back to the federal issue that the Teal spoke to, we, we do know that post the last election we've seen more diversity in our political representatives. How, I mean, how do you feel about, I mean, are you optimistic about the outlook of what that's going to mean in terms of impact? I mean, there's, you know, at DCA they say there's diversity, which is having people at the table, and then there's inclusion, which is making that diversity work. And I think in Australia, we, we, we don't quite understand that distinction and that difference. We think when we have one person on, at the table who's like a person of color or, who, or you know, whatever you, term you want to use for someone who's not white, then that means we're inclusive and that means that it's working and, and hey, there you go, our systems aren't white anymore. <laughs> That's not it. When, when, there's, <laughs> when there's a person of color First of all, one person of color is not going to represent all people of color, right? Really? And, and, I, and Australia misses <laughs> that. The number of times that I've been told, for example, they're like, oh, we would have loved for you to come, you know, to be in our council, in our panel, in this, this, but we already have a black woman. <laughs> yeah. It's like this place for more than one, you know, like yeah. you can have more than one. It, it not only is it allowed, like it's 
it's encouraged and it's good yeah. because then you get a diversity. So that's not that's something that's not well understood in Australia. And I think the bottom line is is precisely because we don't recognize Australia as a white nation. You know, Ghassan Hajj was um, an academic in Melbourne, wrote that fabulous book, White Nation. I feel like it should be mandatory reading for people mm -hmm. to understand just how white Australia is. And if you need, if you need people, if if we need to move past all of these issues, not only do we need to recognize that, but to make the other voices heard. Mm -hmm. So I, I talk about, we're here. You're like, you were asking about how should we um, bring people to the table. We create our own tables, right? And we, make, and we make noise at those tables and we keep making noise at those tables and we bring people to our table. Because one of the problems that I find is when you go to their table, Right, you're, you're there. it's their table, they dictate how you speak, they dictate what happens at that table, you know what I mean? Like if you invite me to your house, you, you dictate how, what we eat and how we eat and where we sit. But if I bring you to my house, I tell you what's what, right? So that's what needs to happen. We need to have these tables happening and we bring people to our table so they hear, because these conversations that we're having here, they're not happening out there. Oh. They're currently counter narratives. Mm -hmm. So there's still the what I call the white majoritarian narrative of race in Australia, which is controlled by white people. So racism in Australia, we're not controlling that narrative of race. It's still being controlled by white people. And as long as that's happening, we're never gonna get anywhere. We need to create, keep having these count, counter narratives and one day they will become the dominant narrative. It's the only way that this can happen. I agree, and our tables have got way better food anyway. <laughs> Just, can, can I speak, can I speak to that question as well, how it functions as well, how whiteness functions? It's not about the majority of the nation is this particular colour of skin or whatnot. It's, it, it functions, and you've got to look at how it works. And it's embedded within everything that we think and do. See, the idea of like being invited as a black woman to a table, say, oh, we've already got one black woman, comes from a place of whiteness is neutrality and objectivity, right? And There's, we no are the There's no self-awareness. There's no self-awareness about the bias. No, it's just a, it's a complete centeredness that we are neutral, natural. You are cultured and ethnic and diverse. So the language about everything that we talk about, the culturally and linguistically diverse communities, that is a way of emphasising the fact that whiteness is neutral and natural, and, and they have every right to be in positions of power. And we just need a sprinkling of the culturally and linguistically diverse people. Mm. That's a way of thinking that has been ingrained for centuries now which then allows us to talk, to, uh, so it's not just talking about race, it's about how we talk about it as, as well, right? So if we had an all black female panel here talking about race, the sentiment, the public sentiment to that outside would be very different to if we had four white men talking about racism here because no one would blink an eyelid at that. They'd be like, that's per perfectly fine. Because if we had four white men talking about economics, they'd be, Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the fact that we had four, three w women talking about economics here yesterday was completely new and brand new for so many of us. So it's like the overwhelming presence of whiteness in positions of influence and power is so naturalized and neutralized that we don't even question it. We find white people find themselves on a panel talking about settlement services and no one feels awkward about that. That's like, there's no shame. Like, oh, actually, what are we doing here? Mm. Like, it's, it's just so normalized, yeah, yeah. right? So we've got white people at the senior leadership positions in all of these organizations, not just like in every space, but even in the spaces that, that are making decisions that influence the lives of non-white Australians. And that's how normalized it's become. It's become the lens. So we're the other in every way we, we, we function in society. So not only, just to add a bit, so not only is whiteness normalized, it's invisibilized. Yeah. And that's how it works. So it's, it's so ingrained in the systems that we don't even see it, right? I always say it's in the way that things function around here. So it's like, it's invisible to the eyes, like you said. So um, for white people, we don't And being reminded you're a guest is like yeah. that far away. Mm -hmm. And what is it about challenging those systems of invisibility and normalized Ruby? Do you think that causes people to feel so uncomfortable when they're having to lose space and not be the main voice in the room. Not be the what, sorry? Dominant voice in the room. I, I, think, I think it's important to note that just because it is invisibilised and made to seem natural that, um, you know, to go back to a little question you posed earlier, that there's a lack of self-awareness on their part of their bias, uh, their part, sorry, white people's part of their bias, and it's not. It's all intentional, and I, and I think that we've 
possibly given the benefit of the doubt too much on that, that they may not have realised or it may be unconscious. There's an intentionality in how we are excluded, how they feed a scarcity mindset so that we do, you know, this divide and conquer mentality so that we do think that, oh, if there is only room for one woman of colour at a panel, on the table, on television, I want it to be me. And if, if it's another woman and she's there and I'm not there, then she is my competition, she's my threat, I need to get rid of her so I can take her spot. Meanwhile, there's four, four or five white people, right? So th this is that, 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 yeah. that classic colonial, that, that is how you know, the West colonised the world. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, they're still doing it to us. Mm -hmm. There needs to be um, some uh, you know, account accountability for when we do point it out when we talk it out so that, that it's not so easy for them to get away with it. So, you know, my story earlier, I was trying to get somewhere with it. I'll just be really quick. My, my point that I was getting with that is that a, a white woman writer in the, she's based in the US, but she went into my book, which is about how white women undermine women of color and call it feminism, took my idea out of it, a term that I coined and basically rewrote it in this liberal website now, she did mention my name in one sentence at the start, and all she said was, in Ruby Hammond's book, it's called The Love Joy Trap. That's not a look at that language. It's not called an The Love Joy Trap. How did it get there, you know? Was it magic? Discovered it. You know, did, did the aliens that build the pyramids come back and just put it in my book for her to discover it so that she could then rewrite it? And she changed it so that it became, rather than becoming a, a, about how whiteness as a whole functions with both progressives, liberals, far right, etc. It became she, her assuming, you know, re, re, regaining, reclaiming that white innocence for white liberalism to point the finger. So she made it about fascists. She made it about how fascists use this what about the children mentality, which they do, but that's not what I was talking about. But she talked about that, saying fascists do this so that they can enact all this violence, you know, against us. And it, it was just, you've taken, you know, it's fine for you to talk about that. But by giving up my name, not even quoting me, just sort of pushing me out of the way, you're taking it away from what I was trying to say. And, and you've just fed into this whole left versus right, fascism versus liberalism, and not, you've taken, it's not really about what I was saying at all. That is the kind of sort of extractive um, form of racism that progressivism in particular takes, and it's that insidiousness, yeah. and just thinking they can get away with it because they usually do, and I called them out on it, and the only sort of concession they made is that they changed it from the, you know, the passive voice to the active voice, so they changed it from in Ruby Hammett's book, it's called this. They change it to Keeps Ruby Hammett calls it yeah. that. Yeah. Look, I think there's a documented pattern of people, white people taking brown people's things. And yeah, and that's a massive thing because they, they take that's our right. ideas that are meant to challenge and do challenge white racism and white supremacy and whiteness and they tweak it so that it somehow turns into a strength for them. It's, it's quite incredible how they do it. And for me, that, that, is, that is how what I really want, would love us to try to break down and, and make consequences for how they do that, Absolutely. how they take our challenge and make it a strength right. for them. If I knew you're about to jump yeah, in. So. Yeah, because I want to build on this and this idea that you said that it's, 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 not, it's not always accidental mm -hmm. and it's not always intentional, but it is predominantly a behavioural pattern that happens far too often. And unquestioned. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's not something that's completely, you're uh, like, mm. non-racialised people are completely oblivious to. So we are all familiar with the discourse of like, women, women, white women in meetings, give a good idea, they're overlooked, and a man rep repeats the idea, they're credited for it. You're all familiar with that already. You know that. Viscerally, you get a reaction as soon as I share that story. So why do we pretend like we don't understand when it happens to a person because of, of a different race? All of these dynamics are parallels. They function in the same way, and you, you've experienced them. So why do we pretend, oh, I don't know about racism. Tell me about racism. How does it function? How does it work? How did you experience racism? It's the same ways. It's just done to different groups of people. At the FECA conference a couple of months ago, I spoke to an audience of a couple hundred people in there, and I said, listen, when we had a, a male appointed as Minister for Women, and I didn't even have to finish a sentence. Everyone started laughing because they know how absurd it is. You all understood how unjust and un un absurd that was. And everyone was like, ha, 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 yeah, yeah, we did, we did. <laughs> and I said, but 
when every single one of our ministers for migration and multicultural affairs are white, you remain silent. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. And that was to the settlement services industry. Mm. No one in that room. So we understand how it works. And we understand when it's, again, when it's women being oppressed, white women being oppressed, we understand the dynamics. When it's people of color being oppressed, we suddenly forget how it all functions. And I think we need to talk about that because I'm just sick of like pretending like everyone's really new to the conversation. I haven't imagined what it's like and I didn't know that this is how it was. You know it. We all know it. And it's like we've got to get to that point so we can keep furthering the conversation. <coughs> um, can I, can well, I just add something yeah, to sure, that as well? Because, sure. um, yeah, just adding to what um, you've been talking about in terms of, um, yeah, just uh, it's not always... Um, unconscious or unintentional. One of the one one of the things that's been a really kind of pet peeve of mine in my past life as an academic has been whiteness studies. Um, and when I look at that and how it's just a reproduction of what um, you know critical race theorists or people of color have been talking about um, race and everything, and you see it's a regurgitation of critical race. And now it's about being talked about by white people as something that's reflexive, as something that's, that's a new field of study. And you're like, you haven't actually done anything. You're just reproducing and then listening to each other now, now that you're talking about it so that you can control the narrative, even the narrative of race, so that it once again becomes about you. So it's not always even in, you know, and in academia is how you're producing knowledge, right? So the whole idea is behind, is behind it is producing knowledge. And that's now knowledge about race, about race relations is being produced through this whole new field of whiteness studies. I think a lot of people here would be familiar with the um, frame um, white fragility and who's coined it and how that's come about, which I don't really, I use it sometimes, but um, to, to reach people, I suppose. But um, the whole idea is what she talks about and what she says has been talked about by women, or by feminists of color and uh, black uh, critical feminists mm -hmm. for, the long, for a long, long time. And all of a sudden, a white woman talks about it mm -hmm. and she gets lots of money walking around, mm -hmm. uh, traveling uh, in the United States, overseas in Australia, more money than black women mm -hmm. who've said the exact same thing that she's talking about are uh, getting um, you know, that money. So it's, it's, it becomes, it's not just an appropriation, it becomes, um, you know, it's, it's a power thing. It's a, like you were talking about a control thing in yeah. terms of now we control the race narrative. It, it once again becomes a white majority, part of the white yeah. majoritarian narrative about race. So we're again being pushed on the side. And that really annoys me. That, that really yep. eeks at me because I'm, it's like you can't even control your own narrative about yep. your own lived experience, right? So this is what, what, stress, what shocks me is that, um, like Irfan was saying, like when it comes to gender, no people would be, up, would be up in arms if a man stood up and said, look, uh, I think I can talk, as a man, I can talk about women mm -hmm. and I can mm -hmm. talk about this, right? Everybody's like, that is the most ridiculous yeah. thing. And yet a white person feels it's absolutely fine to stand up and say, hey, Virginia, I'm sorry, we want to use the term culled because it makes absolute sense. And what you're telling me that you don't identify with that term mm -hmm. is ridiculous. And you're like, okay. If yeah. I said, yeah. I think I don't want to call you a woman, I think I want to call you, no I don't know, whatever term, what would happen, right? And I still insist. So it's kind of like people get the processes when it's about things that benefit um, white men, that makes sense, you know, like, or that benefit white women. But when it comes to people of color, it just becomes this, this thing that either it, nobody wants to hear about it, or if they think Which it makes sense. comes back to controlling the narrative. Yeah, it's controlling right the narrative. So when men are occupying the space and saying, well, I'll, I'll talk about this because I have a daughter, or my wife told me, say, and, for, and, and when they want to occupy and dominate the sense, uh, I guess, the, the, the nar narrative around diversity, it's, well, you know, I've travelled to India. <laughs> or, <laughs> I've so, got a Thai neighbour. Some of my best friends are from the African diaspora, mm. you know. And so when you're hearing that, that level of proximity mm -hmm. to a diverse yeah. attribute, somehow we... We respect that in that, this country. That's considered, oh, you're so woke. Yeah. One of the I things I always say as well is when people want to know about poverty, mm -hmm. no one's going to go to Elon Musk 
Like no one's gonna go to him and say, hey, tell me about poverty. You're gonna go to the person who's either living on the street or has lived on the street or is couch surfing or whatever, right? Someone who's actually experienced poverty. Why is it that race is one of the only things that people feel that they can talk about? Like you're saying, um, I've got a, pers a friend who's a person of color. One of my best friends is a person of color and I can talk yeah. about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, when, when I started working at DCA, we advertised for a position it needed a, a woman of color because the research was about women of color in leadership and stuff. And we advertised on the thing. It was very clear, this is about women of color. You know, we're looking for a woman of color. Women of color encouraged to apply. Lived experiences of racism are integral to this role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got lots of white women and white men applying for that role. Mm. <laughs> and we're currently doing a survey, again, on women of color in leadership. And we had, we had um, over 20% of white women um, filling in that survey and complaining that we keep calling, we keep saying, as a woman of color or as a culturally and racially marginalized woman, do you experience this? And they're like, I can't answer that question because you ha you keep saying culturally and racially marginalized women. Well, yeah, <laughs> the survey is not about you. So it's about again whiteness, <laughs> not just controlling the narrative, but it's because whiteness um, and white body people are so used to consuming space. And so, and it's yeah. this much space, right? Where does it and end when you start talking about lived experience, Virginia? Of race right. as well, yeah. Right. If you, want, if you want to have lived experience, then that excludes me. Where does it end? I mean, like, suddenly I can't apply for a job because I don't happen to fit that category and that definition. Yeah. And comes, you know, white fragility comes back at you, doesn't it? And mm. Very loud and clear in those moments. Ruby, I want to just pivot to you and, and tell it on, on this one. So we've, we've articulated pretty loudly so far that the personal is political. And oppressive systems don't just hurt us, but they shape our identity. They shape our choices and our default actions. So what do you think of the idea that political liberation fundamentally comes as a result of embodying social justice values in our daily, in our daily life and our relationships? Tila. Um, it's an interesting question because I've actually started to, to challenge myself on whether social justice really is the vehicle. Um, well, that's deep. And, and it, it comes back to some of the pieces of work that I've probably written in the past couple of years. My thinking particularly um, around feminism. Lots of people see feminism as a vehicle that they assign themselves to and that's their hook, you know, to go out and say, I, I'm dismantling the patriarchy or whatever. It's language I don't buy into. Um, especially if I think about even from the view of the intersection, race, gender, class, it's, I think we have a long way to go in this conversation in Australia around centering the sovereignty of our governance systems, which is First Nations matriarchy um, predominantly and these systems we have in our communities around decision-making, the cultural authorities who mm -hmm. hold power in our kinship systems. Um, and even I think women of color buy too much into feminism and actually uh, you know, step down on matriarchal values. And if we're not starting to center um, First Nations, women as the historical cultural authorities, decision makers, and that system still exists today, then we are not doing a service in, I think, addressing mm -hmm. what fundamentally ought to be. One, whether you call it social justice, dismantling systemic racism, whatever. Um, like, and it, it, some of the you know, conversations are interesting to me because it's happened to me in my work as well around um, one written about you know in Australia why I don't think reconciliation is, is even a vehicle we need to be um, particularly having conversations around this relationship of First Nations peoples this is about reckoning mm -hmm. this is about addressing a reckoning that our nation really at its heart and soul is again, this power centering of First Nations peoples. We have had probably three decades of reconciliation in Australia, 
what we've seen is tokenism pop up again. We've got the welcome to countries. We've got yeah. the sorry speeches. We've got the walking across the bridges. And I've written about reckoning um, and what this means in this power dynamic. And again, had you know non-Indigenous women write about it in the context, which I found uh, was interesting around um, essay violence. And even if you go into our communities, um, we've been talking about this since day dot. And suddenly this has got traction in the past couple of years. And again, around the matriarchy, um, a lot of my work is centered on that, the First Nations matriarchy. And I've suddenly seen, you know, white women, hashtag matriarchy, post on their grams. And I'm like, you cannot claim this space yeah. unless you're doing the fundamental work from a First Nations sovereign matriarchy. Point of view. That means not just the role women play in reproducing, but it is, or economics, for example, it's the authority to make decisions in our communities. And I think there is so far to go in that piece of work when you, especially even one, for example, look at, okay, the umbrella of social justice, the feminist movement, um, and I guess my final point would be this, you know, Arnie Eileen Morton Robinson and Arnie Jackie Huggins, um, a lot of those <coughs> are matriarchs and elders and even ones that don't have big names like that. There's so many in our communities um, that have done the work and have asserted that this is a sovereign standpoint and yet there's very little, uh, you know, recognition of that cultural authority, that system in, in I guess, dismantling racism, um, tackling social justice. And I don't think we've even really scraped the aspect of that conversation in Australia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Ruby, did you want to add to this issue on where does intersectional feminism then play? What role does it play in how we, how we respond to you know, our voices being taken away and got, trying to reclaim them as, as women of colour in a space that immediately sees our defence of intersectional feminism um, as reactive, as problematic. I've been, I've been told, why do you keep bringing colour into it? That's so divisive. Just yeah. that we're women, can't we just stick together? And I said, the fact that I need to monitor and tone my response to this question is precisely why we need it, right? Exactly. So how do you respond to those uh, feminists that try to derail a more inclusive yeah. view of feminism? I mean, I'm re trying to respond to them less and less. Like, I... You know, I, was, I mean, I was asked a similar question in a recent interview I did, and an, an overseas one, and, you know, they said, what, does, what do white women, what do white feminists need to do to address racism? And I said, you know, it's... I'm less interested in trying to educate them on how to fix it because it seems that clearly not many have been listening, and it's actually, on an individual level, not as difficult as we make out. It's just... Stop treating other people like they're inferior to you. So it's a moral superiority that, that whiteness That's has and Western, Western society has. And don't apply different standards to people that you don't think, that, that you, you, don't think you have to live by. And that's a, like, yeah. that is on that sort of atom level. That's what it is. And that is what whiteness is. It's a superiority that, that makes them feel entitled to our ideas, to extract our ideas. Mm -hmm to take something like sovereign matriarchy and just turn it into a cute hashtag for themselves, right? And, and then that, is, that comes from the first extraction, which was the extraction of land yeah. and, 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 and culture and, and that dispossession, and it lives on. And it's, it is that superiority that, and that entitlement. And also because they know there's generally been no consequences, they can take it. Not enough people speak up. and, and and it's hard to speak up because there is very real punishment. We've all, I'm sure, have all been in some way suffered that retribution for speaking out, whether it's on our own behalf or somebody else's. And it makes it hard to do it again. But if there's some way, and we were talking about this last night, if there's some way that we can collectivise that, so that when we do see it and someone speaks out and tries to defend themselves or to defend someone else or call attention to a particular incident, that we can create a climate of, of that consequence of it's not going to be so easy to keep doing this. And that's on like a smaller level. And then the, hopefully having that big mm -hmm. ripple effect because, you know, ultimately racism is a sense of superiority which then feeds entitlement. 
I think that brings us to you know, a, a platform like this conference becomes a really cathartic space mm. on many levels because Absolutely. we can interrogate these issues really candidly and, and speak with, you know, it's a safe space, right? Yeah. That's, that's part of what this, this event does facilitate. I am going to go to questions and, we, and I believe there'll be, in, in a minute, in a minute, sorry, um, and I will be, there will be a roving mic that goes around. Um, but just to, just to set some ground rules, uh, we're looking for questions, not comments or statements. Um, but everyone will be around for you to mingle with in the break straight afterwards. So Thank feel you. free to comment at that point. Um, but I will be taking question questions in just a minute. You're fine. I want to speak to you just following on, on from Ruby's comment yes. before we go on. The idea of performative allies in this space who, you know, will, will claim to do, to do the work, to be on board, to be on side. You've, you've taken a few of them head on mm -hmm. and sort of told them your piece about what they should do in order to enable a more just response to mm -hmm. ending racism? Like what, what did that conversation, you don't have to name names obviously, but what does a conversation like that look like when you take those people on? Yeah, we are just talking about earlier how I'm running out of patience as well. So I will begin naming names very soon because I'm just <laughs> getting to the point where I got, my, I got my indemnity insurance in place, so I'm all good. <laughs> because I'm getting really tired of this. I really don't want to be on here talking about race. You know, I'm halfway through the years I've got on this earthly planet. I'd rather be writing poetry or children's books or gardening mm. or tending a fruit orchard. I don't want to be here explaining the basics of the dynamics of race and racism to a society that can work out how to do everything else in the face of the planet and all the technologies we've got. We're intelligent human beings in this room and in this planet. I really do not want to talk about race and whiteness and power and sexism. I'm done with it and my heart is breaking and I'm over it. So I am going to begin naming names, calling out organizations and institutions and individuals who are taking up space, who are maintaining racist perspectives, particularly in so-called progressive spaces, spaces where they get to make decisions on the lives of Aboriginal people, the Torres Strait Islander youth, or migrants and refugees, or set policy tones and documents that get published at work summits that refer to us as, as migrants and refugees for our entire lives. I've been here for 40 years, and I'll still get treated as if I'm an illiterate refugee who just got off the boat who needs to be saved. That is, goes back to what Ruby just said. Racism is a euphemism for white supremacy, and it was built on the idea of cultural superiority. If you ever get confused about what racism is, that's all it is. The idea that there's four or five races and that some are better than others is cultural superiority. The reason why people thought they could enslave some certain people and invade others and steal children and put them in missions is because they thought they were doing them a favor. And that sentiment still persists, <coughs> not only persists, it's at the core of our migration settlement services, our so-called multicultural sector, all of our human rights organizations, NGOs and community groups out there are still predicated on the idea of cultural superiority of white people, which is what why it comes through in the language of policy, in the language of conversations, in the language of reports that are written, all of that is still there. And we have to risk our lives and our livelihoods and our relationships and our networks to be able to highlight the blatantly obvious. Because every time we want to talk about it and say, actually, the self-efficacy report is actual white supremacy. I lose friendships, contacts, this, that, blah, blah, blah. It is. The idea that my father survived imprisonment and torture at the age of 17 because he was writing pamphlets and talking to people on the streets about the equality of the genders and the elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty, and he was imprisoned and tortured for that. He escaped to India. He survived there for 10 years, learned, learned how to speak Urdu and Hindu, came to Australia with my mother and I, learned English, got a PhD in education, and we have people writing self-efficacy reports telling us that we just need to learn how to be more emotionally resilient and have better language skills to get get better outcomes in, in, in settlement services. That is cultural superiority. And these people get to sit with other white people as ministers of multicultural affairs and have conversations about us like we just stepped off the boat. My sister is a lecturer at a university in education. She was born in this country and she still has to walk around and get asked by random white men, what cleaning services do you provide? Just because she happened to walk into a laundromat. That's everywhere. From the overt racist to boot Adam Goods into retirement to the allies that work in the settlement services sector who continue to take up space and write policy documents that include one black woman, but we can't have Virginia on there because we've already got one black person on there, thank you very much. That is cultural superiority. And that is what's destroying our planet, 
is what's causing climate change, driving capitalism and the destruction of, of species and, and loss of lives and floods and droughts and fires is because of cultural superiority. Because for 500 years, the Western world thought their culture was superior and now the entire planet has to live with the consequences of that culture of extraction mm. that Ruby touched on. The idea that we can take your ideas, we can take your resources, we can take your children, we can take whatever we want, is what colonization was built on and what capitalism benefits from, and it's what's destroying our planet thanks to climate change. This is why we need to talk about race, because there's nothing on the face of this planet right now that isn't influenced by race. Thank you, Afan. That was quite the summation. I think you pretty much nailed all the different layers there, and then some. We have a roving mic, um, Sophie. Let Sophie. And first question, I think red, where are you? In the red jacket. Hi. <clears throat> Amazing panel. I'm Ruhi. I have two questions, if you would oblige. Uh, Irfan, I relate with your tiredness. I'm calling this my era of exhaustion. Yeah. What is the antidote to everyone? Um, what is the antidote to the exhaustion and burnout? To the activism and advocacy that a lot of people of color, voluntarily or involuntarily, are compelled to do? My second question, uh, specifically to Virginia and what you said earlier, what are your thoughts on straight, white, able-bodied, well-meaning allies, not necessarily with lived experience, claiming to be Jedis and DEI specialists? Mm. Oh, so the, to the to first the... question on burnout. Um, Maybe Tila could also answer Tila and that. Rufan, did you want to... Oh, no, she's directed oh, it oh, 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 whoever. Yeah. Honestly, like, last night after today's... No, yesterday's um, day sessions, we... About ten of us, or I don't know, but, but ten or so of us, we were having dinner and just a drink and talking about our experience and talking just to you know sort of summing up everything that happened and then noting the similarities in our experience and uh, and that in and itself is an antidote to be able to deconstruct it and talk about it in to people that understand it and have lived it and have intelligent things to say about it helps so because before a lot of the time we do suffer it in isolation we, and, and that's that's been my experience because I'm generally a, a loner type of person and that really just makes it harder and there are so many times where I think I'm, I, I don't want to do this anymore what is the point it's like you put everything into your work and then you just get this backlash and you get ostracized etc etc um, but then it's this rejuvenation so things like this I mean I don't want to sound too trite but it, it that this is the antidote to, to find your, your people that can, you can discuss it with and that do come from very different backgrounds in terms of not just the racial um, or gender backgrounds but just the, the work that they do, where they do it. We're from all over the country, from different ethnicities and races and we have these commonalities despite the differences and to be able to discuss it in that environment is rejuvenating. So things like this is, is vital, um, I think, and, and, and deconstructing it afterwards in even smaller groups in this. So... Yes. At Great. the moment, that's the best I can say because I, you know, if you'd asked me this two days ago, I would have just said, I, I don't know, I'm <laughs> close to giving up. So, <laughs> so yeah. don't give up, Ruby. We, we need you in this space. And yeah, your, your vibe attracts your tribe kind of response and the catharsis that you get from these sessions is literally curative. So, mm. next question. Oh, Ruby's yeah. point, though, um, it's a real heed to warning your question because um, we have to accept this that. Truth telling alone doesn't change this country. Um, these spaces are critical, as Ruby has alluded to, but you know, this alone um, doesn't change systems. We have to, each of us in this room, understand our individual agency in being able to go out and mobilise in a world that critically needs us to mobilise and organise. And that's been one extreme lesson from the, the work I tried to do on systemic change. It's that actually, you know, especially as First Nations peoples, we don't get the luxury to have that nine to five job, leave it, go home, you know, like, like colonizers do. Um, 
So I think that's one warning is truth alone doesn't solve these issues. And the other thing is, you know, the, the anecdote to it is allow yourself to have those moments of joy. Um, whether it's just sitting under a tree, reading a book, or like I do, like to go, I have an ocean swim every day um, where I live. Um, and I think embracing those moments allows you to rejuvenate and, and then, then step up to the plate. Um, and it's a process. But yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to add to you. Thank you. Um, There's a question for Virginia. Yeah. 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 Okay. Your question was about allyship. Um, that's actually a very touchy topic for me because um, just to put it in context, I think those who were here yesterday heard Juliana speak. So I, Ju Juliana has been a, a very, very long um, term friend of mine for like many, many years. And we have this organ, she founded an organization called African Women Australia and I'm part of that organization. And in that organization, we don't quite like using the word ally. I mean, we use it sometimes to you know, speak to people, but um, we, we, we're always about, we don't need allies, we need co-conspirators because we think the word ally makes us cringe. Like um, Ruby was said, talking about yesterday that you know, the word intersectionality now is like a cringe-worthy thing. It's the same thing that I get with allies, but particularly white allies in Australia because I've noticed um, they tend to then be the default. Like when people want to talk about race, they go to the allies, mm -hmm. um, which is all fair and fine because they may be, you know, like they may be sometimes talking about um, the same issues that I might talk about, but I will always, always um, have a different perspective just because I leave it and I research it and I, you know, I am in spaces like this. So I'm not saying that we don't need allies. I'm just saying in Australia, they, we tend to default to allies and um, I have issues with that. The other thing is I feel like allyship in Australia tends to be something, someone can walk around saying, I am an ally. And I always say, what have you actually done? Like what makes you mm -hmm. say that you're an ally? Because for me, allyship isn't, a, a, it's not a label you just put on yourself. It's something that, it's an identity you are given by the group in which you're an ally for. Right, so through your works, they will say, yeah, we've seen what you've done and you're a true ally and they will give you that honor. It's an honor. I feel like there's issues with boundaries in terms of allyship in Australia, particularly white allyship, that there's, it, to me, it really feels like it becomes appropriation. And so I'm always very, very skeptical if someone's talk, coming to me like, oh, you know, like I, being an ally, I'm like, okay, I've known you for all of two seconds and you're already telling <laughs> me you're an it. ally. I need to know, I need to see you in action before I'll be like, yeah, yeah, she's a true ally, you know, like, <laughs> and, and the research that we're doing, um, and, you know, we're going to release this report next year in, in, in March at this year. And it's really quite groundbreaking in some of the th things that we're hearing, particularly, f I mean, from women of color in particular about so-called white women allies and how skeptical women of color are um, in relation to that. And in fact, there's some very strong words that were being used in that research in reference to people who call themselves white allies. So I'm not saying you shouldn't say you're an ally, but it's really like check yourself, right? Um, I always say if you're, if you're like, it's in terms of um, racism and anti-racism, I always say anti-racism is a verb. It's a doing word. You can't just be sitting up and I'm like, wake up like I'm an anti-racist just because I didn't call Virginia a nigger today. So like I'm an anti-racist. <laughs> That's not anti-racism. At best, you're a non-racist, which means you didn't do anything. Yeah. And you might as well be a racist, <laughs> right? Um, so, so for me, if you're gonna be an anti-racist, I need to know, I said and thought, I did this, I did that, I do it all the time. And I'm critically reflecting because at the core of anti-racism is not just the doing, it's the reflecting. Yeah. Like you go back and forth and back and forth and you do stuff and you go back. And when Virginia says, I'm sorry, dude, that wasn't quite, that wasn't cool. You're, you're not gonna put your, um, your arms up and go, oh, I just tried, you're not grateful now. You're just gonna go, okay, how do we do it better? And you move on. So it's a doing yeah. word. 
I haven't seen that in Australia, to be honest. I feel like there's a lot of like, I've done this. And so even for organizations that I work with at DCA that come in, they're like, um, we don't really have a race problem at our organization. Yeah, yeah that's because you don't have people of color, that's right. first of all. Yeah. And you're not actually asking people to come to you and tell you the issue. So you're not an anti-racist organization. At best, what you've got is people who like people of color who can code switch, right? Who tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. So really, allyship, I feel like in Australia, we need to start afresh. Like we need to really kind of sit and think, what do we mean by it? And what does yeah. what do the people want? Like you can't just be claiming to be an ally just because I don't know if you heard Virginia speak at an, at a conference or whatever. Like yeah. it's it it takes work, and it's not just one day. It's an ongoing. It becomes an embodiment, is what I say. It becomes part of who you are, part of how you live your life. It's a value, right? Like you live it. So, yeah. um, you, I'm skeptical. Yes. <laughs> no, I think. On, on the ally thing as well. To, I'm going to give it a final quick quickly response. Quickly on the ally thing as well. We'll if you need to question. mention that you're an ally, you're likely not. Yeah. 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 As a clue. Like if you need to say as an ally, then you haven't already proven it. Because if you've already embodied allyship and you've, the person knows it and seen it, then you don't need to repeat yourself as an ally. You don't need to actually say it. And I think, Dr. Uh, what, um, Virginia, you were mentioning uh, Juliana Nkrumah. Yeah. The way she talks about this sort of stuff, I heard her speak at, at uh, the PECA conference as well. Mm. And she says, I don't want allies. I want accomplices. Yeah. And if you're not ready to be an accomplice, then please don't call yourself an ally. Mm. Because an ally is a bystander, as far as passive. I'm concerned. So it's a passive situation. An accomplice is requires someone to actually do something, risk something, be involved. And the, I love the word accomplice because it, it even has that the subtle tone of like there's a bit of danger in there as well. There's a risk involved and that's what it takes. There's a risk involved in trying to undo racism. Not so much for white allies because if you're Robin D'Angelo, you can become a millionaire off of it. <laughs> but if you're, you know, Kim, Kimberly Crenshaw, then you're going to get misappropriated and reappropriated and misquoted for, for, for decades and decades. So white people actually, you can benefit from actually being an accomplice which is quite frustrating in itself. Um, whilst we actually, we risk uh, relationships, friendships, contacts, contracts, livelihoods, just by wanting to talk about it. So if you haven't risked anything when you actually don't have very much to risk, then you're probably likely not to be an ally. Um, and we don't want really allies. We want people to help dismantle systems and structures of oppression. Just like you don't want someone saying, oh, I'm not sexist, I've got a female houseplant, so I know how to look after that. Like, apply the same logic. I guess. haven't heard that one before, but okay. <laughs> Next question. Um, oh gosh, who's keeping track? Of <laughs> blue top and then black top and blue pitch top. Okay. Um, I'm not going to stand. I'm just going to sit and ask my question. First of all, amazing panel. Seriously, so many things um, uncovered. Um, I'll ask my second question, and then if we have time, I'll ask the first. I have mates who are allies, who want to call out racism, they want to discuss the atrocities, they want to talk about it in social situations over a beer, but when their whiteness is called out, they not allies. pull on their That's 15, not an ally. Sorry. Yeah, while well, they pull on their 15% Aboriginal heritage, they say their dad is half Mexican, and it, they other themselves, and I guess my question is, how do we handle the defensiveness? Yeah without shutting down the conversation in a way that is I'll, not othering. I'll be brief, that's not an ally, that's a racist. Yeah. Mm. So I just, I'll, I'll help, help them understand that that's not an ally, that's a racist. Pointing out atrocities and wanting to talk about the horrors and the, oh, it's so terrible that this is happening, that's happening, that's not anti-racism. That's saviorism, which is connected to racism, right? It's like enjoying talking about the horrors and like focusing on slavery during Black History Month. That's not anti-racism, that's saviorism and it's still racist, and the fact that they get defensive the second you want to talk about power, privilege, whiteness, tells you that that's a racist person. So this is what we're talking about. We've got people who want to pretend like they're ally. As an ally, I think that we should care about the children. That's the love joy of the heritage map, right? So like, let's be really clear. Let's use proper English. We've learned the colonizer's language, so now let's use it articulately to explain to them their own dynamics. Yeah. Keila, did you want to respond to that too? Oh, I think he summed it up. <laughs> yeah. um, and I want to add, I, I feel like um, when someone's an ally, we should, maybe we should just kind of do away with the term ally when it comes to racism. 
um, or to race matters and just call them anti-racists because I think that really goes to the core because yeah. then we can pull people up on it because, because when you're an anti-racist, it's an actual, it's a specific way of being in the world and moving through the world and living your life that if you're an anti-racist, it doesn't matter what color skin you are, you know, like when you're, when you're called up on something Mm. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't phase you. You know, like it doesn't. You you you, you get it, yeah. because when you're an anti-racist, you're living, living, breathing, and you know, spewing. You know, um, anti-racism. Whereas an ally has the luxury, like you were talking about. Like I don't have. We don't have the luxury of nine to five. You know, I don't take my blackness and like. Oh yeah, it's now like I, I'm going home and I forget about it. So I think. Maybe let join me in this movement where we're like, we don't need white allies, we need anti-racists, so we change the language and do away with this whole issue. Because allyship is a tainted thing where everybody just wants to do it. And when someone says, I'm an anti-racist, you're like, I need to know, first of all, what have you actually done? What do you do in your day-to-day -day lives? Mm -hmm. Like in your every day when you leave breathe? Because guess what? Racism is pervasive in Australia. When I walk around in the streets, I see it everywhere. I can go into a shop and I can see a person of color being followed around and I can see what's happening. If you're an anti-racist, you're going to pull up that person who's following and going, excuse me, what, what are you doing here? So what are you doing in your everyday life as an anti-racist to see it? So friends like that, if they're like, maybe start with, okay, we no longer use that term that's outdated, like we're using anti-racism and anti-racist and it's it's an embodiment and and you're not gonna you know you're not gonna feel attacked when I say this because you're you're living and breathing it. One of the things that I always say as well, like in my work at DCA, is to people who are like, I'm an anti-racist, I'm like, okay, tell me about your bookshelf. Who's on your bookshelf? Have you read something by a woman of color? Have you read something by a First Nations author? Like what, because guess what? If, if, you, if people actually read and practice things that are written by us, they're a very different person mm -hmm. because our narratives are no way near what makes people fragile. You know, what makes, you know, that, you know, white fragility, which I said I don't use, but yeah, they're not because they know what's what, right? So. No, we don't need white allies, we need anti-racist, and anti-racism is a verb and an embodiment. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. <laughs> and then, and then um, the one next day. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, incredible panel. I just had a question about the dichotomy that was sort of addressed in the panel as well, where as black indigenous people of color, we wanna be conscious of the fact that we don't want allies to take up space and speak about anti-racism and lead up those conversations. But at the same time, we recognize that it takes so much from us. It's, uh, you know, the fatigue that we face and it's a constant sort of addressing of those issues. And also in, uh, as many of you pointed out, real world implications that we get penalized at workspaces for bringing it up. So I wanna address that that dichotomy, especially in a country like Australia, which is so overwhelmingly white, uh, and due to like active uh, actions on the part of the government to keep it so, how do we address the dichotomy where, yes, we want anti-racism efforts to be grounded in the work of black indigenous people of color, but we also have to recognize that if we actually wanna build a society that's more equitable, we are gonna have to incorporate white allies into the conversation and at some level gonna have to give them the mic to you know, speak it in their mates' circles and no, bring no. those conversations. Yeah. And yeah. how do we go about addressing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taylor, you want to start off with that? Um, I guess I'll start from this point, which is it seems like the lens we've been looking at allyship is kind of that one on one mate around the table. Um, a lot of my work, especially when it's about trying to dismantle systems, trying to create systemic change, you actually have to galvanise people in a movement and, and be hard-headed about that. And that, in, in, you know, if you look at Indigenous affairs, that can easily take a decade in terms of um, when you're thinking about, for example, something like, you know, I, I was part of a team that created a, a new court system in New South Wales. That took eight years. Um, back to your point about how, I guess, we still galvanise people. And, and I, the way I understand your question is um, also trying to mobilise that goodwill when there are people who um, can empathise. Um, 
And I've often shifted on a bit of a trajectory with this issue, mm. which is like, if you look at something enormous, like where we're headed now, which is a, f a referendum in the last 40 years, this is a huge opportunity to start dismantling systems. And in fact, what I've learned about grassroots organising, community organising, also bringing my legal knowledge to that space as a rebellious lawyer, is that actually you do need to try and keep people at that table and in that tent mm. to be very hard-headed and focused about the systemic change you're trying to create. People um, create change through, I think, not necessarily all agreeing, but trying to galvanise and mobilise that disagreement to unity. And remembering, if you look at even First Nations peoples, we're over 250 nations, and there's going to be lots of diversity of opinion in that group, but there is power in that group. And so when we are, one, speaking of allyship or whatever you want to call it, anti-racism, um, to me, the main focus is, okay, race is a white construct. We're here talking about systemic racism. In order to change that systemic racism, we need to galvanise systemic change. And that's what the, that's the hard point. The hard point is actually moving the people to a point where we can actually drag the politicians to the table to dismantle their own systems. And that requires a lot of different strategies. So I don't think I've answered your question ultimately, but I'll try and couch it as well in a piece of my work, which is, um, you know, we know we live in a white patriarchal system, and I think the ultimate vision and reimagining of our society should be fundamentally focused on creating space for First Nations matriarchy kinships, and that wow. is the only vision yeah. I really am fighting for yeah. in, in my lifetime. I want to briefly respond to that as well, but I also want to hear from Dr. Virginia and Ruby because they've come all this way out, and I'm happy to go over a little bit as well because this is a cr critical conversation. To quickly answer your question, if you want to uh, work out how race functions sometimes uh, in a public forum, uh, Quanda is a, a great platform to go and watch. Um, there was an incident that we watched yesterday with, with, with Ruby on there. There's another one, an episode, um, where they discussed Utopia, the documentary. There's a snippet that I use in one of my seminars to unpack that. It's um, Auntie Rosalie Kenneth Monks talks about, um, you know, I'm, I am a cultured woman, that, that piece, right. So the whole prelude to that statement that she made is how race functions in this, in this country. And your question reminded me of it. Because your question asked, how do we bring people along? How do we, you know, tone down the language? And you didn't say tone down, but that's kind of what it implies, because we all intuitively understand that. How do we soften it to bring allies along the journey with us? Because inevitably, we're going to need their help to spread the message to the masses. And therein lies two issues. One, the fact that we're toning it down is suiting the oppressor. Two, the fact that we have to eventually get to the masses and, and have someone at ta tables with power to speak is exactly what racism is. So we, we don't need to bring along the journey with us those in positions of power so they can eventually advocate on our behalf like the saviors have always imagined themselves to be. We want to dismantle the structures that concentrate wealth and power in certain sectors. The question that led to that great monologue by, by Auntie Rosalie was, what do you think about the potentiality that documentaries like Utopia might allow white allies to indulge in white guilt and perhaps not engage in the movement as much and maybe they get turned away if we're always talking about the horrors of racism. That type of discourse infuriates me. The production team behind that upsets me. The host that allows that question upsets me. The fact that Auntie was the last person to respond to that question upsets me because the whole premise of that question is like, how can you folk not upset my feelings because the fact that indigenous children are being incarcerated and put in adult prisons and dying in custody is too horrific for me, and that's turning my friends away from the movement. That is the core of racism right there. And that's what we need to call out. Okay. 
think we have time for one last question, and, and all our panellists will be available to talk with during the morning tea as well, I presume. Yes, yeah. do you want to ask Virginia? Oh, yeah. uh, I just wanted to add, actually, just because when you were talking, I just it just reminded me of something that I used to write about in my past life, which is black management of white emotions, because I write a lot around blackness. So black management of white emotions is a real thing that people have written about it, you know, as a as a research thing. And I think we need to be aware of that as uh, people of color, that we do that a lot. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm now trying to not do what I call white adjusting, so that, which is what you were talking about, um, that we have to adjust what we say, how we say it, and who we are in order to fit into the white narrative. And in really, in doing so, we're just reproducing the very systems that are oppressing us. And we have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of the, uh, where the line lies. So when each time we're trying to um, manage white emotions, each time we're white adjusting what role we're playing in not actually changing the system. Yeah. So some of it, yes, it's very painful. I think there was a question before in, in terms of how do we deal with all the, like what I call racial burden and racial stress. Um, well, I don't call it, other people do, and I use their terms. But um, sometimes I, as I think it's also like as I get older and as I am, I've been doing this work for like 20 years, I'm becoming less and less like patience, like I'm giving less, you know, Fs as people know. Um, and I sometimes I just want to say it, you know, like I just say it, and then and then people go and I'm like, you know, or sometimes what if I'm softening it, I say, in you know, you would never say that in my world it's blur, and I just blurt it, mm -hmm. and I say in my world, and I just blurt it. Um, and also, I am embracing some of the stereotypes, the black, ang the angry black woman that used to scare me. I used to um, have my wall, my my whole um, career or my whole academic career around not living up to the racial stereotype of the angry black woman. Now I embrace it, and I'm like, yeah, I am. I'm an angry black woman. What are you talking about? Yeah. You would be angry too if you went through what I go through every day. Marginalization is an anger-inducing process like I'm angry so it's like some of those things I find them really therapeutic mm -hmm. and kind of like I'm not white adjusting I'm not um, you know running away from your stereotype of me that's meant to demean me I'm not doing any of that and I understand and recognize the systems that are at play in trying to get me to manage your white emotions so I think it's just getting that balance right and when I say we no longer need allies it's to me it's more more the wording rather than the actual people I mean of course if we don't talk to uh, white people we end up with what I call half a revolution it means we're we will forever be talking amongst ourselves, which we can't do. We need to have white people at the table. It just needs to be our table. Mm. And we just need to name them what we want to name them. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, has, it has to be, even if they're like counter narratives at the moment, I get it, we're, we're not the dominant narrative, but let's create those tables for ourselves and let's invite them. And also, when they come to our tables, we let them know that it is a privilege for you to be sitting at my table and you sit and listen and you come willing to listen and to learn. Yeah. Woo. Um, like your last, so thank you. Um, so my questions for Tiwa, um, after this amazing and safe conference where we've been able to really have honest conversations, we go back out into the colony and for some of us we work for the colonizers the so-called government government governing structures and within those spaces some of them are actually quite um like in regional areas as well where there is not that much so-called progression um so my question is this when we go back into these colonial structures of governance that have captured accountability systems and accountability houses that are meant to hold the system that we are trying to dismantle accountable. Um, how do we hold that system accountable within the governance structures that it has created to maintain power that it hoarded since day dot, 1788? How do we start doing that in meaningful ways that create a sustainable 
movement that continues to gain momentum over time because the reality is we are going back into the government and we need the government to acknowledge and dismantle itself, essentially. Good question. question? Um, can you have 60 seconds on yeah. this? <laughs> no, you gotta... You've just identified the perennial problem, which is just within these structures, there is no accountability. Mm. And when it comes to creating these spaces, um, there's no rule book to this, you know, as activists, as we know, or advocates, um, particularly as First Nations peoples, we know that there is no justice and no peace in this colony and there is no accountability. Um, I think the one thing to take away though is that your individual agency in creating these ripple effects of changes within your own ind industry, within your own space, should not be underestimated. But, you know, the idea or what looks like accountability in your space, I do not know, for example, but that comes with having the, I get, think, the ability to imagine what it looks like, um, to mobilise within your group and to pursue the change through. Um, Someone recently I heard, you know, it's if you think of the advocacy, I, one of the pieces of advocacy I've been involved in, which is trying to get the government to commit to a referendum. At the last, at the last government, we, you know, kept getting told, no, 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 um, or this is too much, or this is a third chamber, or, uh, um, you know, it's never going to win. Turnbull told me on Q&A it's going to go up in flames. Um, and someone recently in this space said, well, you know what we did? We just had no into yeses. We just went for it. We, didn't, we don't have the luxury to take no as an answer. Mm. And I think as someone who comes from the kind of millennial generation, you do see across our um, cohort a level of complacency when it comes to creating spaces of accountability because even if you're black or white, I should say, actually, the system's really screwed us over in many ways. If you look at our capacity to engage economically in, in ways, you know, like for some of us, it, it's almost impossible to imagine owning a home now. Um, and what I think that, the way I think that plays out is people step away from the system and go, this is too much. You know, I'm overwhelmed by all of this happening. There's no way I can create change. You absolutely can. I think moving forward, um, and, and I think First Nations activism and advocacy is such a testament to this, not just what I've been involved in, but the history of it, land rights. You know, um, we were able to create movements and spaces that are safe for our people, um, also at times not safe. That's what actually comes with activism and creating spaces, is being prepared to step into a space where your livelihood might be at stake. But the takeaway is just do the work. Create the idea, do the work, start movements in your spaces and, wow. and get like-minded people around you mm. because you have to continually call out these systems and these peoples and and I think that is beginning to happen. I do see the turning point, um, especially in some of the advocacy I've been involved in. And I think we can't, you know, sit here today and think, oh, we're not, we're not having an impact. I think we absolutely are having an impact. You can see on the far right and even sometimes on the far left, you know, the um, reactions are so over the top. And so, you know, oh, the white man now is at threat in relation to where we're going um, is, is their response. And I think that should be the reaction we should be getting, yes, because, you know, we're starting to elevate voices that are really important. Um, and we, we certainly need to reimagine what accountability looks like. Thank, thank you, Tila. Um, thank you to all our panellists. I want to give you all just one minute to, to I guess, to summarise as best as you can. Where to from here? Ruby. Oh, um, I, I 
I feel like I don't want to say anything after <laughs> that. I love the way that <laughs> yeah, honestly, ended, I yeah. genuinely don't want to add anything to that. I yeah. want to leave that's, it at that. That's, from my perspective. That's so. perfect. I think thank that you. was perfect. Virginia? Me too. Same I think same. that was thank just you, a though. very perfect summary. Huh? Yeah. I think I'll just add. Um, she can have all of our minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that it's just First Nations sovereignty mm -hmm. was never ceded. Mm. And that should be the absolute starting point mm. for everyone's advocacy, mm. Um, mm. no matter what space you're in. Thank you so much. <laughs> please thank, please thank um, Ruby Hamad, Virgin, Dr. Virginia Mahapidzama, um, Tila Reid and Irfan Daliri. Thank you so much.